My guest on this program is David Benatar, professor of philosophy at the University of Cape Town, South Africa. His research interests are in moral and social philosophy and applied ethics. His most recent book is The Human Predicament, a candid guide to life's biggest questions, in which he invites us to take a clear-eyed view of such questions as, are human lives ultimately meaningless? Is our inevitable death bad? He argues that while our lives can have some meaning, cosmically speaking, we are ultimately the insignificant beings we fear we are. David Benatar, welcome to the program. Good morning. Nice to be with you. Hi, glad to have you here. I was trying to provide a capsule summary of your book the other day to my partner and told her it was a philosophically rigorous pessimism, uh, pessimism about the ultimate meaning of life and, and maybe only limited meaning otherwise, pessimism about the quality of life, arguing that it's really quite bad, and, and then you also take up death, immortality, and suicide in relation to those uh, that lack of meaning and poor quality of life. We're likely not going to be able to cover everything in detail in the book. But I thought we would just jump right in into the question of the meaning of life. You clarify just what you mean by meaning in that sense, and, and also provide a framework of different perspectives for that conversation. So would you please start with those two aspects of your argument? So the two aspects being what I mean by meaning and then whether our lives have meaning. Yeah, the framework, particularly the different perspectives that you use in order to elucidate right. that. Right. Uh, so I don't spend that much time looking at sort of nuanced, uh, necessary and specific, necessary and sufficient conditions for what would make a life meaningful. Uh, lots of philosophers who write about the meaning of life do that. I think when we ask whether lives have meaning, we have a rough idea and a pretty accurate idea of what we mean. We want to know whether our lives have a, an important purpose or points to them. And I think we can ask that question from a variety of perspectives. Uh, we can divide into two broad perspectives. One would be a kind of terrestrial perspective and another would be a cosmic perspective. I think within the terrestrial perspective, there are a variety of levels at which your life could have meaning. It could have meaning uh, with respect to just one other individual human. It could have a meaning with respect to some community, human community, or it might have meaning with respect to humanity as a whole. So those are sort of uh, ascending levels of, of scope, as it were, for terrestrial meaning. And then there's the meaning at the cosmic level, which I think many people yearn for, but which I think we don't have. And I introduced you as being kind of a, taking a pessimistic view. Could you just, uh, for our listeners, clarify what you mean between pessimism and optimism and, and counterpoint of those two? Right. So those two terms, I think, are often used in a, in a value-laden way. So people tend to think that optimism is a good thing, and pessimism is a bad thing, so that if you describe a view as pessimistic, one is sort of inherently criticizing it. Whereas I want to use those terms in a more neutral way. So I want to use the, pe the word pessimism to describe uh, a view which depicts things as being bad. Um, so it's not that uh, a pessimistic view is, is a bad view itself. Um, it's it, it's uh, a view about the way things are, and if things are bad, and the view describes them as bad, then there will be a pessimistic view. Okay, so let's get right into the, this first idea, this uh, idea of the meaning of life, and we'll start from the cosmic perspective. As you said, people seem to really desire that, want that, hope for something like that, but you make an argument in the book that really from that perspective, from the biggest possible perspective, uh, it's pretty pointless. There isn't any real significance to anything that any of us might accomplish in life. I think that is the case. Uh, and I think that's a horrific prospect for many people. And so often what people do is try to find a way for there to be some cosmic meaning. A very common way to do that is to uh, think that uh, God provides us with that meaning, that if we are created by a, an omnibenevolent God who has some purpose for us, then that purpose would provide our lives with cosmic meaning. And although in the book I don't provide a very detailed argument against the existence of God, I think that's uh, obviously a very long, complicated argument that requires books, even if not volumes. Uh, and, so, and I do provide a kind of outline of the view for why I think that is an unduly optimistic view, why I think that the world we inhabit is very unlikely the creation of an omnibenevolent, omnipotent, omniscient being. Could you just say very briefly what part of that argument is? Just uh, I don't want to assume that. Yes. 
Yeah, yes. go ahead. Uh, so I think if one looks around one, one sees really a horrific uh, world. It's a world in which uh, billions of animals are being eaten, often alive, every second as part of nature. I'm not even speaking about human interventions in creating more suffering among animals. If you think of the suffering that takes place among human beings, the amount of starvation that there is, poverty, squalor, that there is the number of people who are uh, languishing under all kinds of diseases of of uh, inflict great suffering, cause great suffering, um, this doesn't look like a universe that is created by an omnibenevolent God. And I know, of course, that religious people have uh, a theodicy, they have a mechanism for trying to reconcile the existence of God with uh, these very unfortunate aspects of, uh, of the world. But I think that this sort of strains credulity. One of the examples I give in the book is if one were visiting a country where you saw oppression and you saw suffering and uh, you were told by your handlers in this country that you're visiting that um, this was, in fact, a country governed by an extremely benevolent uh, ruler, I think one would one would not believe that claim. You would think that, uh, that that is false, and I think we should reach some of the conclusions when it comes to the world as a whole. Okay, so let's uh, go a little bit more deeply into why you think from a com- kind of the positive argument from the cosmic perspective, why there doesn't seem to be any meaning. It seems to me fr- in reading the book that you take a fairly kind of scientific view of of the origins of the universe that it came out of maybe you didn't talk you don't talk about the big bang specifically but there doesn't seem to be any uh, real even if we discount the theistic argument there doesn't seem to be any real purpose to it there doesn't seem to be any evolutionary purpose to it it's just a matter of random changes and survival am i characterizing that correctly and, and could you expand on that a bit Yes, I think you're correct. So I am taking this scientific view because uh, I think that we've got the best available evidence for that. And uh, then we see that sentient life sort of emerges. It didn't perhaps have to emerge, but it does. It's not, I think, through the design of, of any creator. And uh, and with that comes all kinds of unpleasantness. Uh, and uh, I think often the, the objection is, well, how do you know that it doesn't have a purpose? How can you be sure that there's no purpose? And, of course, I can't be sure. Uh, I can't be sure of, 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 of most things. But I must draw my conclusions on the basis of uh, reasonable evidence. And if I don't have good evidence for thinking that there is some purpose all this, then I must just see it as a kind of na- natural evolution and, um, and uh, not having any broader purpose. In the, in the book, it seems to me you also make an argument from the idea that we as human beings on this planet, even the whole planet together, doesn't really have any impact in that larger sense. That's correct. So if we, uh, if we understand meaning as having some kind of positive impact or, or purpose, it's hard to see what we are doing with respect to the rest of the universe. What, uh, what difference does our existence make to the rest of the universe? And it's not clear that there's any such thing. Okay, so that's at the cosmic level, and uh, one other aspect of that I want to just kind of bring out is if there is no meaning at that level, then that uh, has a transitive property. property. If there's no ultimate meaning, then that kind of goes all the way down into the terrestrial level that you're talking about, right? Well, I'm not sure I would say that. So I think there is meaning at the terrestrial level, so I think that... Uh, certain things that we do can have a purpose uh, at the terrestrial level. So if, for example, one uh, alleviates suffering, perhaps one invents a drug that uh, relieves relieve suffering or prevents suffering, well, the activity that one's engaged in has had some purpose. It has had some point, and it has in- impacted in a positive way on people around you. And so I wouldn't want to say that we should sort of give up and stop living as a result of this. I think we should abandon our activities. If our activities do have some purpose here, that's probably enough uh, given that we're already here. Um, but I do draw these, what I call, anti natalist uh, conclusions from the absence of the cosmic meaning, that I don't think that we should be creating more beings that need to generate this, uh, this sort of very local form of meaning. And uh, as I think uh, you also wrote a book, maybe, or you, you've argued that we all would have been better off not even to have been born. Uh, yes, I have written a book on that, and I do think that's the, the case. Uh, so that's for a combination of reasons. The one is just uh, the quality of our lives, I think, is much worse than, than most people think. Uh, even the best quality, even the best lives, I think, are much worse than most people think. 
And then in addition to that, it's that our lives don't serve some important cosmic meaning, some important cosmic purpose. Okay, and I, I just want to clarify for me, too, when I was speaking earlier about this idea of if there's no ultimate meaning, no cosmic meaning, I didn't mean to say that there's no terrestrial meaning at all, because you do make a very nuanced argument at the at the different levels that you talk about at a terrestrial level that there is meaning. It's just that in, in the overall sense, we can maybe find meaning locally in, in, in our relationships and such, but even that ultimately doesn't make any real difference, and then cosmically we don't. So it, it, it kind of filters on down that there's no ultimate meaning. That's kind of what I was trying to say. Right. So, yes, it's, uh, the fact that our lives have terrestrial meaning doesn't mean that they've got cosmic meaning. And I think that we should we should be aware of that distinction and realize what meaning our lives uh, do have and also what the limit of that meaning is. So let's get into some of the details of that then. So you, you distinguish, I think, three different levels at the terrestrial level, kind of a, a top level uh, where you might have some impact uh, socially in a broad sense, but not many do. And, and so would you talk about those different levels and the kind of meaning that human beings can have uh, on a terrestrial level? Yes, yeah, that's actually sort of the, the, the least uh, broad spectrum. In other words, we look at just having one life having meaning with respect to some other individual. I think that is usually the form of meaning that's most attainable. So one can be in a relationship with a particular other person. Normally it's not just one other person, it can be a number of other individuals. Uh, but to, to have, for one's life to have impact or an important purpose with respect to one, at least one other person's life, that seems to be the most attainable. So one can imagine, for example, uh, a husband and a wife spouses who have um, that important purpose for one another. Then if we look up a level, there's sort of level of the, there's meaning at the communal level. And uh, sometimes people do things that uh, have value for their communities. They might be uh, doctors who provide for the health care of, uh, of people in their community. They might be uh, police officers who uh, secure the environment and make it a safe place to, to live. They might be teachers who are educating the children uh, these are all important ways in which people can contribute towards their communities. And then the highest level of terrestrial meaning is where one contributes to, to humanity as a whole. And this, of course, is much harder to attain. There are some people who do that. One of the examples I give in the book is that of Sir Alexander Fleming, who uh, discovered penicillin and made a massive impact on humanity as a result, a massive positive impact on humanity. And so is the highest level of terrestrial meaning. Yeah, I think I, it's important for me to point out here, too, I don't know how aware you are that uh, we live in Northern California, and we've just had some serious fires here, and I think part of the message out of this local community radio station has been that we did provide some kind of service to the community, and there was meaning in that, and there was certainly meaning in the work that all the firefighters did, and there is also kind of the loss side of things, and I think we need to get in that uh, with all the people who lost their homes and, and many who lost their lives as well. So there is meaning communally, I think, and that it could be seen to be very real for us here locally. Absolutely. I, I don't think we should undermine that for a moment. So as I said before, once, once we exist, once we're here, we should try to lead lives that are as meaningful as possible. Uh, but if one asks, should one sort of recreate this whole human endeavor? Should we be producing more people who are trying to produce meaning in, in, in the future? That I think uh, we we're advised to do. Okay, I just want to now announce that if you're just joining us, you're listening to Consider This on KZYX. I'm your host, Stuart Campbell. My guest is David Benatar. He's author of The Human Predicament, A Candid Guide to Life's Biggest Questions. You can find out more on the web at considerthis.us and at the KZYX website. So... Um, let's try to get in. One, another distinction you make in the book, and I, I want to try to bring that out a bit, little bit here, is a distinction between like objective meaning or real meaning and then a more personal subjective sense of meaning. And I think a lot of the terrestrial meaning is at that level, right? It's, it's kind of the meaning that human beings subjectively create, interpersonally create. Is that correct? Actually, I think there can even be kinds of objective meaning uh, at the um, at the terrestrial level. Okay. So the distinction is this: it's, um, it's something is subjectively meaningful if you think that it's meaningful, and something is objectively meaningful if it actually is. 
So let's imagine, for example, some meaning at, uh, let's say, the communal level. Somebody uh, might be making an important contribution to their community, and so they might, their life might be objectively meaningful at that level, but if they don't feel that it is, then they might lack the subjective feeling of it being meaningful. So um, I think one can use this distinction between objective and subjective meaning uh, throughout the spectrum from meaning at the individual level to meaning at the, uh, at the cosmic level. Okay, and, and there is some interplay there, would you say, or, or no? I, I mean, um, somebody... In, go ahead. In, sorry? No, so interplay between what? Uh, so somebody who subjective, they may objectively make a contribution, but still not feel that it's meaningful, that that's going to, uh, I'm not quite sure how to ask the question even, that, that there is some interplay there right. and, and something important in that distinction in terms of how people find their lives meaningful. Yes, so that, uh, let's imagine somebody uh, does not have the subjective meaning. In other words, they don't feel like they're making a contribution. Well, the quality of their life is, as a result of that, going to be uh, going to be diminished. It's a it's a very unfortunate feeling. In fact, uh, often people don't want to go on living because they have that subjective sense of uh, of a purposeful purposeless life. And uh, so, it is quite important if one's life does in fact have objective meaning, even if it's only at some terrestrial level, uh, to recognize that. Uh, so, people can be mistaken in two ways. They can either think that things. Uh, that their lives are not meaningful when they are, or they can think that they are meaningful when they're not. Right. Those are two kinds of errors that can be made. And you you talk in the book about how people do tend to make that error. It, maybe it falls along the lines of people who are uh, eternal optimists and people who are are more par- par- pessimistic about their in their orientation to life. Yes. So let's if we think about it at the cosmic level. There are some people, of course, who believe subjectively that their lives do have meaning at that level. So they've got subjective cosmic meaning. But I think objectively they do not have that. So they would be, uh, in my view, uh, deluded. (laughs) Okay. Um, So let's see. Let's let's move this conversation then into, because there's a definite connection between this idea of meaning and the actual quality of life, because you make an argument... And it's, it seems to me to go along with the, some of this subjective ob- objectiveness part. People can feel like their lives are meaningful and feel like their uh, lives have some quality, but be deluded about that or make mistakes about that at, at all these different levels, right? So if you'd start to shift the conversation into quality of life and what your ultimate conclusion is there. Uh, yes, I think you're absolutely right. So it's possible for somebody to have a mistaken view about how well their life is going. And again, they can be mistaken in one of two ways. One can either think that the quality of one's life is better than it really is, or one can think that the quality of one's life is worse uh, than uh, than it really is. And so uh, we more commonly focus on people who are underestimating the quality of their life, and uh, we think that they're in need of, of, of therapy. But I think there's good reason for thinking that the other area is a more common one. So it's more common for people to overestimate the quality of their life. And there's lots of uh, psychological evidence for this, for what's often called an, an optimism bias or a, a Pollyannaism, uh, where one thinks that things are, are better than they really are, or one thinks that they will be better than they really will be. That's a, that's a common mistake humans make. And it seems to me that part of what you're trying to do in the book is provide some evidence, provide at least a discussion and an argument to show that that optimism bias is really quite prevalent and that if we take a kind of clear-eyed, cold-hearted view of things, life is pretty bad. The quality of life is pretty bad across the board. That's correct. So I have an argument which uh, demonstrates that there is this optimism bias, but then that's not enough. One then has to sort of look objectively at how well our lives are going. And what I do there is look at uh, different conceptions of what makes a life uh, work good, what, what makes a life go better or worse. And I don't take a view on which of these three conceptions we should choose. What I try to show is that irrespective of which of these views we have, our lives go pretty badly. So if you just think in terms of uh, pleasures and pains, I think that there is more pain than pleasure in life. And some of the evidence for that is that uh, pains tend to be worse than pleasures. 
if you think about the most intense pains, they can be a, a lot worse than the most uh, fantastic pleasures are good. If you look at how long pains go on, they tend to go on longer than pleasures. So there is such a thing as chronic pain. There's no such thing as chronic pleasure. There might be chronic satisfaction, but there's also chronic dissatisfaction. So that's not an advantage in favor of the, of the positive. Um, so then... There are lots of these tests that we can use, which would show, I think, that uh, there's going to be more pain than than pleasure in 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 life. And if we look at uh, our desires, this is another view about how the quality of our life is to be judged by the extent to which our desires are satisfied. Well, I think that uh, our desires are satisfied much less often than they are thwarted. If you think about having a desire, um, most of the time, or much of the time, you won't fulfill that desire. But if you do, you'll only be temporarily satisfied because some new desire will uh, come in its place. And there's a broader problem in that uh, often our desires are actually limited by what we can reasonably expect. So if you desire to live, for example, to 200, you know that is a desire that's going to be thwarted, and so many reasonable people just sort of curtail their desire. And so there's already some limiting in, um, in, 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 the, in the quality that we can, that we can expect. The third kind of theory is about what's sometimes called an objective list theory. And uh, that says that certain things are just objectively good and other things are objectively bad. And if we look at some of those things, I think we see that we fare quite badly. So let's imagine you take, I don't know, a long life to be a good thing. A long life that's with the stipulation that it be with a reasonable quality. Well, on the spectrum from uh, living for a second or two to living for centuries or millennia or even forever... Uh, we are much closer to the lower end of the spectrum. If you think that knowledge is a good thing, then think about how much uh, any individual knows from nothing to everything. Most of us are very close to the nothing end of the spectrum, not towards the omniscient end of the spectrum. So lots of things that we take to be objective good, if we look at them, uh, as we are say, a clear-eyed way, we're not fearing too well at all. I'd like to stay on this topic at the risk of kind of uh, being a downer about it. If this optimism bias really is kind of people's natural orientation and that part of that is to uh, just avoid actually taking a clear-eyed look at how good or how bad things are and and getting a good uh, objective sense of that, I think it's worth spending a little bit more time bringing forth some of the evidence about both, it seems to me there are a couple of levels, both people can do that individually, personally, like they might say, well, you know, my life's pretty good, it's okay, um, but maybe there's some optimism bias in that, and, and then if you take a broader look overall on the planet, there's an awful lot of suffering going on on the whole planet, so if you wouldn't mind expanding on this a little bit, because I think it, it may need to be there in order to kind of counter the optimism bias that may be prevalent. I'm not sure I quite understand where you want me to go, but I'll say a few things with If I'm off track, just let me know. Okay. So uh, I think that the clear-eyed view is in many ways intolerable. Uh, it's, it's very hard to live with that clear-eyed view to, to see how poor the quality of life is. And so I think that what many people do through these optimism biases is, is shut out the bad. Um, sometimes they'll recognize it in other lives, and they may uh, wonder how people continue to live in those circumstances. Or, um, but, but when they look at their own lives, the, the impetus to denial, to uh, re- repressing these thoughts about how bad things are, is immense. And I think there's good evolutionary explanation for that, because if you think about what sorts of beings are likely to persist with life and to reproduce, it's going to be ones that have that optimism bias, the ones that are going to push these thoughts uh, away. Um, so people who are, going to, who are going to see how bad it is are much less likely to want to reproduce the human condition by producing new people. And some of them might even take their own lives. Now, we'll probably speak about suicide in the well, but let me just hasten to add immediately that I'm not recommending suicide as a general course of action. Right. <laughs> okay. Um so generally, your I, your thinking is that if you take a clear-eyed look overall for all of us, um, while life is not unadulteratedly bad, that overall there's more bad than good. And so on balance, we have to say that it's bad. Would you also add in there that 
the prospects for it getting better are, are similar? Uh, I think that's true. So a lot of people's optimism consists in thinking that we're going to make such fantastic scientific advances that uh, much of human suffering will be eliminated. And I don't have that optimism. I'm not saying that there won't be improvements. Uh, there may well be. I doubt, first of all, that the improvements will be sufficiently good that it will be worth producing new people. Uh, but I also think that the time lag between now and then is going to involve so much uh, human suffering that there's something obscene about uh, continuing to reproduce in the hope that down the line there'll be these advances. So think, for example, about somebody advancing this very argument, let's say, 2,000 years ago, and saying, look, we've got no uh, anesthetics. I mean, they wouldn't even have a word for it, but they say we've got nothing that can dull our pain. If uh, one's leg has to be amputated, it gets cut off uh, while one's fully conscious, perhaps with a bit of grog. And uh, they said, but one day, maybe humans will invent an anesthetic, a way in which we can put people to sleep while surgery is performed. Well, think about the, I don't know, 1,800 years between then and when anesthetics were discovered. That seems like a lot of human suffering, which you're going to justify in the name of this future benefit of an anesthetic discovery. And I would say something similar about our position now with respect to the future. Okay, so let's just take that as a given then for the moment and build on that. And you do, so we've talked to, so far, just to bring everybody up to speed, kind of about there is no ultimate meaning in life, though we can find meaning at the terrestrial level. Most of that for most people is going to be kind of at the personal individual relationship level, though some may be able to have some meaning that goes beyond that. And then overall, uh, life is pretty bad. And uh, so not very much meaning or some meaning, limited meaning, no cosmic meaning, and overall life's pretty bad. So then the three things that you specifically take a look at in uh, the book are death, um, um, immortality, and, and then suicide. So I think death is uh, the part of the book. I think it's the longest chapter in the book, and it's kind of some of the most nuanced argument that you've got about it, and maybe we can't get into all the details of that, but you do end up uh, coming to a conclusion about death as well. So would you start to get in that into that in, in any way that you think is going to most communicate it for people? Yes. Yeah, so, uh, so I think the obvious response to what I've said so far is that if the quality of human life is so bad, then wouldn't it just be better if we were dead? And I want to deny that. Uh, at least I want to deny it as a general claim for all human beings at all times. So I do think that life can get to the point where it's so bad that death is the lesser of the two evils. And so I do want to retain that possibility, and I do want to argue for suicide under those conditions. So when one really is an extremist, uh, there are no prospects, of, uh, of recovery, let's say, when suffering unspeakably, it may be that though death is bad for you, it's going to be the, the lesser of, of two evils. But it doesn't follow that all of us should right now take our own lives, because when I say that our lives contain a more bad than good, it doesn't mean that they contain more bad than good right now. It might be that um, once we're here, we have an interest in continuing to exist, that that interest has not yet been defeated, Although our lives might degenerate to the point later on where they um, they do become so bad that the interest is defeated, so that's why I think my my views about the quality of life don't entail the view that uh, that we ought to take our own lives now. So I'm not sort of recommending uh, recommending suicide. Um, I also think that even when um, death is the lesser of two evils, it is still an evil. And that is because I think we do have this interest in continuing to, to live. And that's why I think uh, the human condition is, in fact, the human predicament. So we're caught between a rock and a hard place. Um, the quality of life is not great. On the other hand, the only way out of that is to die, but dying comes at a cost to us. And so we're trapped. Once we're here, we're trapped. Whereas if we've never been brought into existence, we would have the interest in coming into existence, the interest in continuing to exist. And so that's really the only way of avoiding the human predicament. It's, it's not to be born. Once you are, it's too late. 
Okay, so let's delve a little bit deeper into the argument about death. You say death is is a bad, is an evil, and you have a fairly well articulated argument for that. Now, it may seem obvious to people that death's bad, but um, I think maybe if they were to read the book and read the chapter, it may, might not be quite so obvious. And so I'd like you to get into just a bit of the detail about why death is bad. Correct. So I think you're quite right that the natural view, the ordinary view that most people have is that their death is something to be avoided, it's something that would be bad. Uh, but there is an ancient philosophical argument, going back to Epicurus, uh, that death is not bad for the person who dies. It might be bad for the people who are left behind, because they'll mourn the deceased, uh, nor is Epicurus saying that dying is not bad, because dying can be quite a painful and unpleasant process, and He's not denying that, but he's saying death itself, not the process, but death itself is not bad. And that, he says, is because uh, where you are, your death is not, and where you, when you're dead, you aren't. And so you and your death don't sort of coexist. And so for that reason, your, your death can't be bad for you. Now, there are various presuppositions behind this Epicurean argument, and one of the things that I do in the book is uh, is examine those presuppositions and see if there's a if there's a good response to Epicurus and and he follows. Uh, I do have a caller coming in. Uh, my callers, uh, listeners know that sometimes I open the phone lines at about this time. So if you do have a question about the meaning of life, the quality of life. Uh, once again, you're listening to Consider This. I'm your host, Stuart Campbell. My guest is David Benatar, author of The Human Predicament, A Candid Guide to Life's Biggest Questions. You can give us a call at 707-895-2448. Uh, David, I'm going to go ahead and take the first call. Hi there, you're on the air. May I have your first name, please? Laura. Hi, go ahead. Good morning. I just received a report from the head of the Department of Psychiatry, Ed Bullmore, at the University of Cambridge, saying that depression, unhappiness, hopelessness is not a mental illness, but rather a physical illness uh, caused by inflammation, which can be resolved by taking anti-inflammatory drugs. And this is something that vaccination clinics have known, but could not explain. So this is uh, revolutionary, and I would like to know what uh, you think about it. Okay, good. I don't know, David, if you Thank know you anything sir. about the details of that particular idea, but it certainly seems to go to the quality of life issue. So, so I should just say that that was very faint to me. Okay. Uh, but I think I, got the, I think I got the gist of what was being asked. Um, it was about, about depression being caused by physical phenomena. Yes. That yet. Um, so, uh, look, I can't judge that question, um, but I think there are questions surrounding what depression is. And uh, I think, given our society's optimism bias, we tend to label as depressed uh, many people who might just have a an accurate view about the nature of the of the universe and the, and, and, uh, and the amount of suffering that there is. So, I do think that people can have a grimmer view of the world than they really should. And those people might be de depressed without good cause. They might have a, an, an unhappy outlook w uh, without being justified. But I, I think that there are a category of people who have a pretty grim view of the world, and they are they're correct in thinking that. It's an accurate view that they've got. And that some of the more chipper people are actually suffering from, well, not suffering, well, I mean, it's not, it's, it's not such a hardship, but they, they, are, um, they are deluded. They're the ones who've got an inaccurate view of the world. So I'm a little worried about jumping into labeling all people who are depressed as having a pathology. I think some depression is a pathology, but I think that some uh, optimism is a kind of pathology as well. It's not a pathology of mood. It's not that you, you're feeling unpleasant, but it's that you've got an inaccurate view of the world. Got another call. Let's take that. Mm -hmm. Hi there. You're on the air. May I have your first name, please? If your radio is on, you have to turn it off. Uh, hi. Um... This is uh, Nora. I was going to uh, make a little clarification that the um, hopelessness, the depression, is caused by inflammation. Okay. Can be alleviated by anti inflammatory drugs. Right. And the studies are very, very positive. 
Okay, well, my guest is not an expert in, in, in any of that, in the causes of uh, depression or anything like that. So as he said, he really can't comment about that. Sorry. Oh, okay. Thanks. All right. If you do have a question for my guest, who is David Benatar, author of The Human Predicament, A Candid Guide to Life's Biggest Questions, you can give us a call at 707-895-2448. We're talking about the meaning or meaninglessness of life and the overall quality of life. And uh, he makes an argument in the book that ultimately at a cosmic level, there is no uh, meaning, but that we can find meaning at the terrestrial level. For most of that, us, that's going to be at the kind of personal level level uh, from a personal perspective and maybe a communal perspective and from a l more limited number of people maybe in a broader perspective and that ultimately overall on balance the quality of life is is pretty bad uh, have I characterized that right David I think that's correct yeah okay so one a one aspect when we were talking about death and before I took the phone call um, that I'd like you to bring out a little bit more in terms of the badness of life is this idea that it, it that it annihilates a person so would you expand on that idea of death being an annihilation and that being part of why death is bad good so that's a little bit of background is necessary in response to that Epicurean argument that I mentioned, uh, many people offer what's called a deprivation account of the badness of death. So what they do is they recognize that once you're dead, you no longer exist, but they say the badness of death consists in the fact that you, through your death, were deprived of the good things that you would otherwise have had. And uh, so that's attempting to sort of bypass the Epicurean view. Now, I think that that is one way in which a death can be bad, by depriving one, but I think that's an inadequate picture. I think we need to augment uh, the deprivation account and add what I call the annihilation account. And so that view says that part of what's bad about death is that it involves the obliteration of the self, the annihilation of the self. And uh, I think adding this feature, the annihilation feature, has a number of advantages. One of them is that uh, on the deprivation account, Death is not bad at all if uh, your future life would not have been good. So if you've reached the end of the road, as it were, and uh, all you have to look forward to is unspeakable suffering or uh, some state of, sort of semi-consciousness, that because there's nothing good to look forward to there, your death doesn't deprive you of anything. Whereas I'd want to say it does to annihilate you, and so that is why your death could still be bad, even if it's not bad, all things considered. That might be that you are annihilated, that's bad, but given that the alternative would have been worse, you may be still better off dying. Okay, let's uh, get uh, some more calls coming in. Yeah. Hi there, you're on the air. May I have your first Hello. name, please? Turn off your radio, uh, please. Yes, my name is Rich. Rich, go ahead. And I've got a question. Uh, why, I mean, why bother? I mean, I know life is bad and there's a lot of sorrow and all that, but if there's no meaning to life, why bother? Uh, you know, why bother, um, on a cosmic level, why bother creating it at all? Okay, I think uh, we'll have David answer to that. Thanks, Rich. Thank you. Thanks again. It was very faint. So the idea was that because uh, there's no meaning, why bother? Yeah. Uh, but I didn't get a lot of Why bother with what? Why bother with life? I think he, he's he's talking, if there's no meaning at the cosmic level, why bother? Uh, and I think you would probably argue that there is meaning at the terrestrial level, and so maybe that's why to bother. I'll, I'll leave it to you. It, to, exactly, yeah. yes. So once we're here, we can make the best of it or not. And once we're here, we've got people who are connected with us, and I think there's a reason not to make them more miserable. Let's imagine you say, look, I can't be bothered. I'm just going to take my own life and finish it. That can have a massively negative effect on the people around one. So rather than do that, recognize the absence of the cosmic meaning, but say, let me do what I can at the terrestrial level, because that's better than nothing. If you're worried about your life not having meaning, it's worse for it to have neither terrestrial nor cosmic meaning than for it just to not have cosmic meaning. Okay, another call. Hi there, you're on the air. May I have your first name, please? Hi, I'm David. David, go um, I, I have two things. One is um, evolution has uh, given us uh, certain reactions uh, in the brain. It's dopamine and things like that that, uh, that uh, make us uh, do the things that uh, keep us alive and experience pleasure from doing those things. I'm wondering if that's what you mean by terrestri uh, terrestrial meaning. 
And um, the other thing is um, there may be no reason for us not to commit suicide, but I, I don't see any reason for us to do it either. Okay, good. We'll let uh, David respond. Thanks. David, did you well, hear no, both I, I don't mean um, that uh, our chemicals in the brain are, are meaning. Uh, I think that the the purpose, the, the local terrestrial purposes that our lives can have, the, the good impact that we can have on people and other, and animals around us, uh, that that's the meaning. Um, the sort of chemicals in the brain, which your caller was speaking about, I think that's got more to do with one's mood and how one uh, responds to life. And uh, there, I think that um, there are good explanations for why we have those um, uh, those chemicals, why most people have those chemicals, and why they uh, have the more positive mood. But I wouldn't want to identify that with the meaning. Now, I did miss, given the faint line, I did miss the last part of the questioner's comment. Um, I tried to make a note, but I can't read my own notes. Sorry. So um, I think part of what he was saying about the evolution aspect of it as well is not just the chemicals in the brain, but or maybe I'm going to expand on the caller's question. And the idea is that uh, evolution has got us here. It's got us here at this particular place. It is, you have to assume that people, as, as products of evolution, we have evolved to kind of seek meaning, right? So um, that's mm. certainly part of the, the story as well, correct? I think that's true, yes, but um, we don't just uh, obey all the evolutionary forces, as it were. Often we uh, uh, we get back and sort of critically evaluate those. So uh, I think about aggression. Now, aggression is a feature of humans. It's evolved in humans. But we don't just sort of indulge all our aggressive impulses. We, we need to take those in check sometimes. We need to think, uh, is the aggression appropriate here or is it not? And I would say something similar about uh, other evolved properties such as our optimism. Uh, and I just, uh, I'm thinking as I'm listening to the caller's questions and listening to you, so because uh, I'm getting uh, a clearer idea of the view, I think, from our conversation than I maybe got in reading it. So you really do see life as a real predicament. Like, we really are caught between a rock and a hard place. And given that, it would probably be better if we didn't exist at all. And probably it would be better if we didn't procreate and continue this predicament, this rock and a hard place situation. But since we're here, we might as well make the best of it and find what meaning and what quality we can. Exactly. Okay. I uh, got another caller. Hi there, you're on the air. May I have your first name, please? Naomi. Naomi, mm. Naomi go ahead. Um, yeah, I need to turn off my radio. Okay, go ahead. Um, hold on one second. Yeah, I'm... Um, I'm glad that you just said that, you know, that since we're here, we might, as, we might as well make the best of it. Because up until that moment, I was thinking, gee, this is such an individualistic, me-firster type of uh, approach that, you know, it leaves out the whole social dynamic that while we're here, we need to make it better. And that may take a long time, but we're working it out. And that is what makes us feel better it makes us feel like living. And I think that would be part of the meaning uh, uh, that you find at the terrestrial level, right, David? Well, I don't uh, know exactly. quite what you mean by the terrestrial level. I don't know uh, uh, so sorry. much between that. I think that we're suffering under the rule of the patriarchy, and that is how we have evolved, like it or not. And it's a culture of death. It's a culture of, of um, one individual, a male, at the top, and everyone else having to um, give up something to that being at the top instead of having a egalitarian, non-hierarchical um, way of organizing, and that makes all the difference. Okay. When you have when you don't when you have that that wonderful freedom of equality of true equality, then you want to live because it feels good and you do good things. So okay. that's my comment for that today. Okay, Thanks Naomi, I've got a couple of themes that uh, David can pick up. Thanks. So sorry, uh, you were both talking, David, over at the same time, and I so I let her sure. go. Go ahead. Do you have a re an immediate no response? Yes, sir. I couldn't quite understand why your caller thought that it was such an individualistic view, because throughout what I've been saying is that terrestrial forms of meaning are all ways of reaching beyond the self to other people, whether it be another, another individual, uh, a human community, or the human species as a whole. 
so throughout what I've been saying is that the meaning is to be derived from the impact, the positive impact that you can have uh, on others. And so it's about connections with other people. That's exactly what it's about. Um, I don't think that a more egalitarian uh, society solves this. I mean, clearly there are problems with hierarchical societies, or unduly hierarchical societies. That's just a, another of the many problems of, uh, of human life. But even if we were to eliminate that and have a more egalitarian system, we would have all kinds of other problems. And in fact, all kinds of attempts uh, in, uh, by humans to have more egalitarian societies where we all just address one another as comrade. Those tend to be very oppressive societies. Now, perhaps that's not the ideal egalitarian society, but even if we could, uh, contrary to the fact, establish the most uh, ideal egalitarian society, there'd be all kinds of other features that are beyond our control, including um, disease and suffering and things that might not be a product of a hierarchical society, or might not be exclusively a product of a hierarchical society. Let's take another call. Hi there, you're on the air. May I have your first name, please? Yes, Alan. Alan, go ahead. Yeah, hi. I'm baffled by the proposition uh, that it would somehow be better if we were uh, we didn't exist. I mean, how how it just seems an absurdity. Okay, um, should you want to take uh, David? Yeah, really good. And I have him address that. Okay, thanks. So, Dave, Sorry, Dave, I did not hear that at all. I don't okay. know why the line is so faint, uh, but perhaps you can just... Yeah, maybe the phone me. connection. Yeah, Alan is asking, it seems that uh, it would be... It seems to be an absurdity that it would be better not to be here at all. I think that's many people's initial reaction, uh, and I think that is because of the evolutionary forces that operated on us. Uh, I think what happens is we, we are here now, and when people are asked, to imagine the possibility that they were not here, what they incline to is the idea of them vanishing. And so what they're really imagining is their death. Whereas if they really thought carefully about what it means, it means that they would never have come here in the first place. Now, that I then find an absurd idea. I mean, obviously, billions of possible people who've never been made actual. Uh, and we don't sit around mourning the non-existence of those people. We don't say gee, what a bizarre, absurd phenomenon that all those beings that could have come into existence haven't. And so those of us who aren't here, I think, are the unlucky few, not the lucky few. Got another call. Hi there, you're on the air. May I have your first name, please? My name's Heather. Heather, go ahead. Okay, well, uh, it was the anniversary of Earth Day, I don't know, some maybe the 20th anniversary of Earth Day. Uh, this thing was published about where they'd done... Uh, the math to figure out is the earth worth saving? How much would it cost to, to uh, heal, repair the environment? Uh, and how much are these uh, resources that would be saved uh, worth in financial value? And what they came up with was that the earth was indeed not worth saving. And, um, and so I remember being happy because I thought, Oh, great. Now they'll figure out that they're doing the math wrong, <laughs> right? They'll figure out that they're, the math is wrong. <laughs> this is the same thing. This conversation, it, it is framed. There is a frame of thought. There is a, a thought process. There is, a, there is a, a foundation and a framing of this conversation that is in error. And so everything about it is in error. It is meaning does not equate to value, okay? Okay. There is value in life. This is a godless conversation. This is godless. This is, this is a disease of godlessness. And if, if, if his life doesn't have any meaning, which it might very well not, I would just say, why are you here? And don't let the ozone layer slap you in the butt on your way out. Thank okay. you. Goodbye. Thanks, Heather. We got it. Uh, David, were you able to hear the get the gist of that? I got the gist of that. I think what we saw in that caller was a sort of aggression that one uh, often finds in response to this idea. And I've been on the receiving end of many, many much worse comments than uh, than that. Um, your caller was relatively polite in not sort of explicitly suggesting that I kill myself, but many people have suggested that I do that. Unfortunately, they just not listened or understood the argument. Um, I, I, not that it, my argument entails that I ought to take my own life, and it's not that I'm recommending that other people routinely take theirs. Right. So there's very little I think I can say to people who are not listening and engaging carefully with the argument. 
she did make uh, one point that I wanted you to draw out because I think you make it in the book. Uh, perhaps I'm remembering incorrectly, but that, that you do draw a distinction between meaning and value. And uh, I think it's it seems to me too that some people can not hear the what they don't hear in the argument is that you are saying there is meaning, there is terrestrial meaning. There's just not any mm. cosmic meaning. So it's not like you're denying meaning at all. Um, and, and exactly. So if you want to elucidate that a little bit, and, and do you draw a distinction between meaning and value, or do you see, use them mostly synonymously? No, no, I don't uh, use them synonymously. I think there is a difference uh, between those. Uh, positive meaning would be one kind of value, but there are plenty of other values as well. Uh, and I don't think that my view is a valueless view. Often my view is described as nihilistic, and I think it's nihilistic in some sense. In other words, if you're asking me, is it nihilistic about cosmic meaning? Absolutely. If you're asking me, is it nihilistic about value? David, you there? Uh, David, are you there? We might have lost the connection. That would be too bad, because we are getting close to the end of the hour here. Uh, David, maybe can you hear me at all? Uh, I think we've lost him, and I think that we just don't have the time to bring him back. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up the conversation, uh, try to summarize as I've been trying to do maybe uh, here in the end. He is not making an argument that there is no meaning to life. He's making the argument that there is no cosmic meaning. There is no ultimate meaning to life. So from the biggest possible perspective, uh, part of that argument is that we really don't, as human beings, have any impact in the larger sense. Um, he does make a brief argument in the book. One of the standard responses to the idea that there is no ultimate meaning is, well, that uh, some religious argument that provides some meaning. And he makes a, a brief argument, though he doesn't go into all the detail about why a religious argument might not be able to provide that kind of meaning. Um, so he is talking about that there is meaning and that the real meaning in life once we are here is in our relationships with people. We can do that at a personal level, at a communal level, and maybe, maybe even at a broader cultural level that's less available to most people. Well, I do have a couple of calls, so maybe I'll try to squeeze one in, and I, I don't know that he can. He, he's not here to respond, but maybe I can. Hi there. You're on the air. May I have your first name, please? Yeah, this is Mitch. And, hey, Mitch, uh, go ahead. Yeah, you summed it up pretty well. I mean, we're living organisms, and I think, you know, our thing is to uh, recreate ourselves. And to do that, we have to kind of help one another and make sure that we're safe and we live and we eat and all that. And beyond that, in comes the religion for the bigger questions. And I have, you know, <laughs> all kinds of theories about that. You know, is it crowd control? Is it to scare us? Is it to answer questions we can't answer? But basically, yeah, you said it. We're here just to... You know, stay alive and recreate. That's what animals do. All right. Thanks, Mitch. Hi there. You're on the air. May I have your first name, please? It's Don. Don, go ahead. Uh, I, just, a, just a small uh, examination of the yin-yang symbol. Uh, because using the terms bad and good so, so dualistically and so, such a Western dualism, but with the Asian mind, you know, the, uh, the, the, the yin yang symbol has a black fish and a white fish, but the black fish has a white eye and the white fish has a black eye. So the, 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 the darkness emerges from light and, and light emerges from darkness. To just call things bad and good is, is to ignore the fact that things change constantly and, and are emerging from each other. Okay. So, there. That's all I had to say for now. All right. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Appreciate it. Okay, well, we are getting down to the end of uh, the hour here, and I think I'm going to leave it right there on this. And uh, in two weeks, on November 10th, my guest will be philosopher Tim Crane. We'll be taking up the religious uh, argument a bit in that show. He's the author of Meaning of Belief, The Meaning of Belief, Religion from an Atheist Point of View. You'll be able to listen to this uh, edition of the show or download it later on today at either the show's website, considerthis.us, or on the kzyx.org website where I also have links to authors and books discussed on the program, as well as a listing of upcoming shows. Tune in for next week's edition of Politics, a Love Story with host Bob Bushansky in this same time slot. 
And stay tuned to my colleague, Gordon Black, who's now in the studio for The Wondrous World of Music, which follows right after Pulse of the Planet. And I'll talk to you again in two weeks. Thanks. Researchers trying to grow poison ivy in a lab discovered that, mysteriously, all their seedlings would be destroyed by a fungus. I'm Jim Metzner, and this is the Pulse of the Planet. And we began to ask ourselves the question, why would poison ivy plants harbor a fungus that would kill the seedlings of the next generation. John Jalesko is an associate professor in the Department of Plant Pathology, Physiology, and Weed Science at Virginia Tech. He and his team had figured that the relationship between the fungus and the poison ivy had evolved to kill any poison ivy seeds that might fall near a poison ivy plant to avoid unwanted crowding and competition from new plants. But then, how would the poison ivy seeds ever grow? What was a good clue was the fact that the seeds needed some sort of acid treatment in order for them to germinate. At this point, we realized that birds during the fall and winter eat a lot of poison ivy seeds. And that led us to speculate that a migrating bird will come and eat a poison ivy seed that has this fungus on it. And then as it passes through the bird's gut, called the gizzard, that contains sand that the birds will eat, poison ivy seeds get ground up like a food processor. And what we think happens is the fungus will get stripped off the outer part of the seed